Okay, good evening. I think we've got most of the people here. And while Michael's trying to figure out sharing with his coworkers, that would be fine. I'd posted the link in the chat. Uh, and it should be a an open link. You don't have to log into Blackboard first. It's just easier that way. So um, let's see who we've got here tonight. Uh, let's see, most of you probably know me. My name is Alan Watkins. I'm a core adjunct professor at National. I've been teaching in the cyber program for seven years now, I'm trying to think back that far. And I've taught the, um, actually I helped rewrite the 602 class, which is uh, threat modeling and Intel uh, about a year and a half ago. And over the, over the last year, trying to teach threat modeling has been hard to do in the class because it covers so much material in one four-week session. So uh, I thought I would hold this special session just to have a little bit more detail into the tool itself and threat modeling uh, in general. Um, if, if you have to drop off during part of the session, that's fine. Uh, the recording uh, will be done uh, probably later tonight, at least on the the, um, the 606 course where I'm hosting it. And I will be moving it over into uh, the Blackboard area where the other instructors can post it on other class sites as they see fit. You should have, in the announcement, there is a zip file that uh, contains several um, several documents. Uh, including the um, the threat modeling actual raw TM7 uh, threat model file that is used in 602, as well as this uh, the slides that we're going to go over tonight. There's also let's see if this works correctly. We're going to bounce back and forth between a few things. This uh, overview and example of threat modeling is part of the 602 course and has been for about a year. And we're going to go over some more, uh, some of that, and we're going to use the same um, assumption and model building that we that is used in that example. It's a little bit different than the course uh, assignment that is in uh, week two, I think, or week three of the six two class. So just to get started here, let me get. So we're going to talk about things sort of at an intermediate level. I'm going to jump back and forth between the two presentations so that we are uh, sort of on a level playing ground. If you have questions uh, during the session, that's fine. Uh, just raise, do the raise your hand uh, icon, and I'll stop. And uh, or you can type type your question in the chat window either way, and we'll try and address them. Uh, if it's something that I'm going to address later. I will let you know that so that when we get to that point in the in the session, hopefully I will get to what your question is. So again, the purpose of tonight is to get into a little bit more detail, more down in the weeds per se. Um, hopefully you can apply this if you haven't already or you're taking the 602 class or planning on taking it or if you need it for maybe your work uh, assignment that you can do threat modeling at your job. I built this session to have nine learning modules in case it's used uh, in a regular course. We, we're going to zip through them pretty much. Um, if we need a break, we might take one, but uh, we'll just work our way through kind of quickly. Again, there's a zip file that has uh, a Word document, which is new, uh, that goes with this presentation. It, it uh, defines or shows the data element properties. The TM7 threat model file is the original one from the 602 class. And there's also an example threat model report, both in PDF format and HTML format. Um, you don't have to worry about the disclaimer at this point. Uh, so these are the modules that we're going to try and cover tonight. Uh, reviewing the description, the assumptions, and external dependencies. If you have been involved in any system development work uh, or programming, uh, you know that you need to document everything you do, uh, and, and that's the best way so that you're not 
linked forever to a project, for, for instance, where everybody has to come back to you to get the information if it's in if it's documented within uh, either within a system or within the programming code or in this case within the model. We're going to show you how to document what needs to be in in the model itself. We're going to go over the model elements. That'll be showing what's in that Word document and which properties apply to each of the elements. And an element would be, for instance, a, a workstation would be an element, uh, a client or a browser client would be an element, uh, an AD domain controller would be an element, uh, etc. And then we're going to look at the model connectors, what kind of data flow connectors go between the different elements. Then we'll be looking at the scope of the model. Um, that probably should go first because you scope what you're doing before you even start building the model. And then defining trust boundaries. What is a trust boundary and where do you use them? Then we're going to look at creating and modifying a model. So I will use um, different stages of the existing model that we is used in 602 to, to talk about through that. Then once you build it, you have to analyze it for threats and vulnerabilities. And then we'll look at how do you, in the modeling tool itself, how do you apply mitigation? Uh, some of it, actually most of it is all manual within the, this particular modeling tool. Some other tools, uh, when you apply certain mitigations, it, it recalculates the threats automatically for you. Uh, and then creating a report. Obviously, your output needs to reflect the effort um, that you did. And before we start uh, going into the details, uh, I'm going to stress that threat modeling is usually not an individual uh, event. <laughs> uh, it's usually a team effort. And the, uh, there's probably one or two people that know the threat modeling tool itself. And they would work as facilitators for the team. But it has to be a team effort to be able to be a, a complete and valid model. Uh, we're not really doing that in this case as far as this, this would be more like training for how do you how do you manage the threat model itself or the tool. So reviewing necessary documentation uh, in the first module. All right, so what what goes into the the documentation? In the tool itself, you create a threat model name, and that should be reflective, something simple, but reflective of what system or application is being modeled. It lets you put in the owner. So that would be the CISO or the CIO, or it could even be um, a business application owner in another part of the uh, organization. Contributors uh, would be the primary group or team that is, is putting together the threat model. Then there's the reviewers. Uh, it should be obvious that those are the people that are going to review the model. <clears throat> and then the three asterisk areas are sort of critical information, high-level system description, assumptions, and external dependencies. Uh, these are things that are usually known from the business as far as what's, what system or what application is being developed for which this threat model is being uh, created. Uh, in, in the courses, in the 602 course or other places, you might run into this. Even if you have a, uh, an assignment or a project description that says what you're going to be doing, you need to include, even if I wouldn't directly cut and paste, but at the minimum, you could cut and paste the, the project or the assignment description from the, uh, from the course into this uh, description field, as, as well as doing assumptions. And we're going to go into more detail on all, all of these and external dependencies. So all of all of this information, all eight or seven of those items will appear in the TMT report. And the more you can put into the system itself, the less you would have to do as a separate, separate document. So this is a snapshot. And I know it's not ultra visible, but on the left-hand side, if you click on the file menu, and we will go into the tool a little bit later, um, about two-thirds of the way down, the file menu is model information. And when you click on that, 
you'll get the window on the right that pops up. And that has all the fields that we just talked about. Right now they're blank. At the bottom, there's two fields that we didn't talk about, which I'll show you when you look at the tool itself. That's basically, the, even though it says title, that's the template that you chose when you started to create the model in the first place and then the version of the template. And let me see, I, I'm going to pop over to the other. OK, so we're going to, so the high level description, uh, it may be provided through your work or through a school assignment. It could be limited to just a, a high level outline of uh, what the description is or the project definition. Or it could be, a, you could have a very detailed system or network description. Now, you're not going to, you're not going to be able to post diagrams into the um, that that box, the description box in the tool, you would have to keep the diagram separate. And also you should, if you have a really, if you've got several pages of description separate from the tool itself, you're not going to, you're not going to post all of that into the, into the tool. You need to summarize the description and make a notation that there is an attachment with a, with a detailed description and diagrams. The um, the goal is, if possible, put uh, as much information in the description box in the tool as possible. Uh, you need to at least list what the goal is. You should probably list the major components and functions and high level inter or the interactions with other systems. Uh, I'm going to step back and talk about scoping for a minute. When you're scoping what the tool is going to model, if you're doing a large system development with, uh, let's say you're doing an, H, an HR system, an accounting system, and a cus service system, hang on just a second. Um, you're, you're talking about three you know, major computing systems. You would probably want to model each one of those, and each one of them would have a note of how it interacts with the other two. And uh, the person who just raised their hand, go ahead and uh, well, if you have a question, go ahead. Or you can type it in the type it in the window or use your microphone. Okay. Well, I'll if you if you have a question, type it in the chat for me. I'm going to go back over here to this uh, overview and click down. So, some again, uh, before you start doing a model, you want to know why you're performing the model and what is being modeled. So that's part of the scoping. Uh, concept. People in the, on the project team should know that threat modeling is usually an iterative process. It's not a once and done deal. And let's see what else can we get out of this page. So uh, the, the last sentence is pretty important. The goal is to identify and eliminate as many threats as possible before the system or software or whatever it is goes into production. So this is the scenario that we're going to be using. Um, and again, if you're given this in an assignment, you can cut and paste it or paraphrase it as long as you cover all the details um, in the in the uh, description box that we just talked about in the tool. So we're going to look at it, implementing a web-based portal for students to access the finance system. Um, they're limited in what they can do within the finance system, but that, if you think about it, that is the limitation of their authorization setup, the, the user account authorization, and may or may not be part of the threat model per se once you shift connection from the user's workstation all the way into the, the finance application. So this gives you some information about what they can do 
<clears throat> meaning it's it's limited to just their own account as opposed to an accounting employee at the university who has full access to do a lot of other things. Uh, so make sure it's, there's, a lot of, there's several of these slides that talk about considerations before you start. So if you haven't gone through this slide series, you probably should go through and look at, uh, there's a comment about being iterative, but read through these. The, this is uh, important for you to understand before you do the modeling. And again, another reminder that it's a team effort um, so that the model is more complete that way. The second bullet on this screen, have a fresh set of eyes. So you may have, uh, you may be lucky enough to have someone else either in your class or in your work who is somewhat knowledgeable about threat modeling, but is not a direct part of the project team and have them take a look at your description, your assumption, risk analysis, and, and eventually maybe even the final model. <clears throat> so that they can provide feedback. Um, that's true on things other than threat modeling where you have like a third party review, proofread or do whatever before it goes, goes out. Um, not so much in the classroom setting as it would be in a work setting. So this is, an, this is um, now assumptions which are different than the description. So I'm gonna go back over here, sorry about that. And so assumptions needs to include the conditions or procedures, other infrastructure parameters that are not necessarily in the model that you're building, but those things that impact security or risk. So for instance, the model might show there's an authentication step, but it doesn't show whether it's single factor, two factor or multi-factor. And so you would put a definition of what kind of authentication is used in the assumptions box. Uh, another example, if there's four different user groups that have access to the same server or asset, so again, it could be, and we're talking about the finance application, um, so the four user groups would, would or could be the students, which we're trying to set up, uh, faculty or staff, the accounting staff, and then the IT administrators. So those four groups have all, the, all access to the same server, but different levels and different permissions. And another example might be an assumption that all remote users are required to have a digital certificate um, on their equipment and not count directly just on like two-factor authentication. So let's go back. <clears throat> so the assumptions that we're looking at um, and again, this would be part of the information you should be provided or would be provided uh, as part of the assignment. If, it's, if you don't get um, detailed assumptions with the assignment, feel free to create your own because this will help someone who's looking at the threat model understand why you uh, used certain elements, why you did certain uh, data flow and uh, use certain security measures. So we are gonna assume that there are already staff and faculty users that um, have both internal network access and remote access uh, through a secure web portal. Um, the staff uses a VPN, but we're gonna find out that the students do not. It talks about user authentication through an Active Directory account and access or authorization is managed through security uh, GPOs within Active Directory. So this for students, it's gonna use um, HTTPS, but it's not gonna require them to go through a VPN. There is a web portal server in the, in the data center that's part of the DMZ that they connect to. They are going to authenticate through a separate AD uh, domain um, than the faculty or staff. And if you're not familiar with um, Active Directory or domain controllers or a user account, 
management uh, in some fashion you should be um, because that plays a key role in the security of any system. And it talks about once they do six and log in, they will get a list on the web portal. They will get a list of available applications that that student is authorized for. And hopefully you all know the difference between authentication, which just lets them log in, and authorization, which gives them permissions to do things once they're logged in. So some final assumptions for this particular example. Um, internal workstations are all controlled and managed by the university IT department, so they get patches and updates automatically and, and anything else security related on the internal network. The remote systems are required to have current OS and security software like anti-malware installed. Um, there are ways during login for the, uh, for instance, the VPN, get VPN gateway or the web portal gateway to do a check on the remote system. And if it doesn't have up-to-date OS or patches, they can be quarantined and, re and uh, rejected access. So we're gonna talk about starting the model in just a second. We skipped over external dependencies. So the way that this current model is, is viewed there really are not a lot of external dependencies other than the students needing to have updated OSs, the browser, and anti-malware. Um, if we were looking at a different type of system where external vendors were accessing the uh, university system, then there would be some other dependent requirements. You don't have to define every single dependency but you do need to find major interfaces where there might be a data exchange. This whole process is looking at data flow. Uh, it's not looking at the physical network or even really the logical network. You can use this to also describe configuration requirements for remote users because they are external to the, to the internal corporate network. Um, in some future iteration, we'll talk, or the, this this presentation will go into uh, cloud services, which we really purposely avoided because that make that just makes the model a little more complex. And as a matter of fact, probably the cloud services would have a model by themselves uh, and not part of this this primary model, but it would have dependencies listed. And there should be notations um, in the description and even on the model diagram itself as far as the, um, the interaction or the interconnection points where it would leave, data would leave this model and flow into or back from another model. And that gets to be a lot more complex when you're linking different models. So again, just some examples of external dependencies some employee requirements for external their external system and i mentioned the vendors um, vendors requiring uh, a vpn plus a digital certificate to get into the network just as an example okay let me go back and make sure all right so we're about to start creating the model um, i started originally with this hand drawn little diagram and now we're going to start into the model itself let me go back here no actually we're going to go into the we're going to go into the modeling tool so hang on a second while I share something different Okay, so this is the threat modeling tool itself. And I started to place a few um, elements out into the into the workspace here on the upper left.
Yeah, so actually, and we'll I was going to talk a little bit of, later about the different tools. So this is uh, TMT 2016, which is what I've been using uh, because there wasn't anything else available at the time. Last summer, I think it was, uh, Microsoft released TMT 2018. It's uh, it's called a click to click to run software. So you don't really install the application locally. It runs from their website. Uh, there are part there. Most of it runs locally, but it's downloaded from the website as opposed to being a local installation. Uh, it looks a little bit different, and I'm going to cover some of the differences in a second. Uh, in the upper right corner are the stencils. I should probably back out of this. I'm going to back out of this for a second. So this is what the um, front page or the main page looks like. This template for new models is what I was talking about. It, it's the SDL knowledge base core. And anyway, the other, the 2018 model, or sorry, the 2018 template uses an Azure cloud service model. So I'm going to go back to where I was. Um, and what the difference is, is in the stencils. And we're going to talk about those stencils in a minute. So you start your diet. You, you have to have an understanding, which is why I did that paper, pen and paper drawing. You have to have an understanding of what is going to be included in the model. It doesn't have to be uh, neat and clean at the beginning because you can probably end up moving things around. I knew from my project description and the assumptions that there are there's an existing faculty staff uh, connection. So I created a faculty staff that's a human user. The data flow actually starts from the workstation, and we have a browser client and a web portal. And for the for the model, the new system is now going to be um, student users. They also have a workstation and a client, and they have to connect to the portal. In the stencils on the upper left are the elements that you want to add to create your model. We're going to go over these in a little in a lot more detail in just a second. So as long as you know what you're going to connect to, and this is just the basic um, who is going to connect to what at, at first, what you need to do is also figure out, OK, it's it's a finance application. So somewhere in here, we're going to have to have a finance server. Um, the finance application probably has a back end database. You also want to consider that there are existing internal users that may or may not affect the students, this, um, the modeling of the student uh, access. But it might be something you want to add to the model just in case there's a, a change on the internal access point. Um, I'm going to go, I did this in stages here. OK, so I'm going to close this for a second. OK, so I decided, well, we know that the faculty staff also has a VPN um, gateway or VPN connection that they go through. That is probably in front of the web portal because they have the VPN gateway sets up a secure connection before it gets to the authentication point. Then we have, so I added the internal admin, faculty workstation, and then we have a finance application, and like I said, a finance uh, SQL database behind it. Now, I'm not making any connections yet. I'm just putting in the parts or the components of where, where the data probably will flow through, and I will get to connecting it in just a second. OK, a little bit more complex. Let me do this. So what have we added here? We have an external boundary firewall. We now have a faculty staff AD domain controller and a student domain controller, an internal boundary firewall, and an application level firewall for the finance group. And then now there's also an internal 
faculty, staff, AD, uh, domain controller. Again, trying to think through these steps may or may not happen quickly, um, but as, as a team, you would be brainstorming what are the different components that are needed to show where the data is going to be flowing through. One thing I um, mention in the 602 classes that I teach, you don't need to put in every single security device. You put, I put in the boundary firewalls and the application firewall because those are key points. You don't have to put in, uh, for instance, an IDS or IPS system, a DLP system. So Michael, that's a good question. Um, they, it could be either way. The way this one is built, um, the way I envision it, that all this stuff in the center here is going to be within the DMZ, and they probably are um, separate from the internal network uh, domain controllers. So there probably is, and if depending on the size of the network, um, where I worked at the city of San Diego, uh, you know, you're geographically dispersed, and you've got different subnets and different um, facilities all over, you know, 450 square mile area, um, then there were domain controllers sp spread throughout the, the infrastructure. So part of it depends on the size of the network. But in this case, <clears throat> there'd be one internal domain controller to handle all the internal network, and then uh, two domain controllers in the DMZ one is specific to the students because they don't have an internal domain controller, and then uh, one for faculty and staff because from a, from a security standpoint, it's easier to control that domain controller within the DMZ than it would be to have, uh, for instance, from the VPN gateway, have to go into the internal network um, domain controller for authentication and then back out to the web portal. Yeah, so, and again, uh, there are different ways to configure this, and it could be that it's not an AD domain controller. It could be other other authentication. And when I show you the, um, the Azure uh, stencil elements, uh, you'll see different, um, a different view of this kind of topology. So again, this is just an example of what you might need and that's certainly the real thing. Let me move on to the next. Okay, so we put in most or all of the elements that we wanted, and then you look at doing the connections between them. The tool is set up. You'll see there's usually two arrows for everything because one is a, a send or a request, and the other was a receive or reply for whatever that request was. So rather than using a two-way, a single two-way arrow between connecting points, the data flow is, it's better from a um, threat modeling standpoint if you show each data flow one, one direction only. So this looks kind of complex. Um, it's actually not that complex. Now, uh, we'll take the top area first. The admin or staff, which already have a connection, uh, goes from the client through the boundary firewall um, to the VPN gateway. And it goes over to the domain controller for authentication. And if they've authenticated correctly, then it, then it routes them to the web portal. Now, there are other ways that I've seen where they actually get to the VPN gateway first, then to the firewall, and from the firewall, they got, they got authenticated and then get to the web portal. So the, the data flow be different in a real situation. Uh, you may want the VPN gateway as the, as the first connecting point for those particular users because, again, that sets up a secure um, network tunnel, and once they've reached that point, then that would give them authority through the firewall 
to the domain controller for authentication. For students, they just go directly through the boundary firewall, get located, and then go to the web portal uh, because they don't have the VPN gateway. And then we're going to talk about going in from there. So uh, anybody have any, I think this is a good spot to maybe start if any questions or comments about how this is getting built. I know we're, we're going to do some actual building of um, connection, connections here in a minute. That's good. And actually, before we, I'm going to, I'm going to switch gears again and go back to sharing. The other. So the, uh, and sort of an expansion on your question is, how do you know what to put into the, into the uh, data flow diagram in the first place? Um, which elements and which connectors? So now's a good point to get to this part of the presentation. Uh, okay, we're going to look at the separate Word document. Actually, we're going to do that right now. So this is, um, it's actually a PDF in the zip file that you would have received. This shows, I'm going to blow it up a little bit. This, this goes down that list of stencil elements. Um, from from TMT 2016, it shows you what the element is at the top, and it shows you the properties below it. And I'm going to just page down a little bit until we find something that we've used. Okay, so here's a browser client in the upper left. Below it are the attributes that you can assign to that browser client. By default, it comes through with the code type as unmanaged. And so threat modeling was built around software development. And that's the main reason it has that particular element, that attribute, even though it may not apply to the browser itself. But um, other attributes that you could have selected, it says running as. So you can force an application to run as um, a system level application, a local user application, uh, etc. Isolation level, and we're going to go look at some of these on the system. Um, is there any isolation down to like an app container level? Um, that can be an attribute. It accepts input from, so you can restrict where does the input come from? Is it keyboard strokes? Is it um, a local user? Is it a system user? whether or not it, it implements or uses authentication, whether or not it implements or uses authorization, and whether it uses a communication protocol or implements a communication protocol. And then finally, is the input or the output sanitized? In other words, does it do data validation on the input or output? So that those are all potential attributes that you can assign to that particular element. There are... Uh, let's see how many pages there are in this thing. There's nine pages, and there's usually six per page. Um, so that shows you how many data elements there are. Uh, I'm just paging up. So take a look through that. You can use as a reference to, to try and select which element you want to use based on the attributes that it has available. I'm going to go back here. Uh, and remember, this is a data flow diagram. It's not a physical network or a logical network diagram. You can rename the component. So even though it says browser client, you could rename it to something specific to your environment. And you would want to choose the element based on the attributes you want to apply and not so much what the name is. So. Um, Michael, on the, to answer your question, the, the data elements, let me go back to that real quick. Let me see if I can find. So 
before I forget where they are. Okay, the next page. So here's like HTTP, HTTPS. So these are all the um, Sorry, it gets a little blurry, doesn't it? Um, but you can look at the different attributes and you can tell it what protocol you want it to use. I don't really. When we go to the live look, um, it'll be a little bit more obvious. Um, so, so hold on to that thought, Michael. Uh, this is just a list of all the different process elements. I'm going to zip through them, um, but it gives you obviously about 50. There's also com something at the end called free text annotation, which basically just puts a text box on the diagram to let you put in a note of it some sort. Then this gives you a list of, for instance, under this generic process called a browser, these are the different elements that we looked at in that browser. And again, uh, I'm just going to zip through these because they're part of the list that shows the elements and their attributes. And again, more detail. Uh, none of these are. So, so at, again, my, my point being, as you're trying to choose which elements to include in the diagram, it's important to look at the attributes that are related to it so that you can apply the correct both level of security, but also functionality that is provided. And we're going to talk about trust boundaries in a while. OK, we've covered this. Basically, usually a whiteboard is a good thing to do with a team to um, draw up your your chart before you start putting it in the software. Um, if you have multiple user groups, you probably should map one user group at a time, how their data flows to and from. Make sure you include authentication and authorization steps because that has an impact on the threat uh, level. And I already mentioned that you don't have to put every single network component in. You'll notice I didn't have routers and switches in the diagram. Our chart started with a human user, but you don't have to. You could you can start it with a thick client or a browser client or some other workstation of some sort. Um, with the assumption that there's a human user uh, manipulating it. Obviously, at the beginning, like I said, you don't concern yourself with the connectors. Try and reflect the data flow as closely as possible as you know it. And again, this is where the team comes in. So you may be, as a security professional, um, aren't familiar with totally with the business application side. And so the application development team would help provide input in that area. If you put the wrong element in and you just later you need to replace it with a different one, then swap it out and make sure the attributes are what you want. The sequence up front doesn't usually matter, although it's good to place it close to what you think it should be so that you ha have fewer changes later. All right, so I just mentioned that about the elements. So go again, go through the um, the chart. I'm going to show you really just well, this is probably a good point to stop and look at. So these are the elements from the 2018 version of the software. The Azure Cloud uh, template has obviously different and not as many um, elements. But you should be able to see that they're really focused on the Azure environment, even though they have like a generic database. Um, they actually do have one thing that isn't in the um, 
2016 version is this data flow indicators for request and response at the top left here. Uh, but basically, most of this relates to the web, both the Azure cloud environment, but it's it can be used for other cloud services. So you could you could use this actually in an app like AWS or things like that if you wanted to. All right. Connectors. So now we're going to talk about the connectors, and Mike, hopefully this will answer your question. Um, there's 48 elements. 10 of them are data flow connectors. And you have to be careful when you add them to the diagram that both the beginning and end points actually link up and connect with the elements that they're supposed to be connecting. Um, and we'll show you what happens if they're not. Usually, they become a dark black line, a solid dark black line, um, when they are connected correctly. And if they're not connected correctly, they are a grayish colored line. So these are the different connectors that are available. And so part of these, like IPsec, uses certain protocols just by its nature, as does HTTPS. But even within those connectors, you have different um, attributes. So these are the attributes that are usually available. So the type of network, whether it's authenticated, whether the source or destination is authenticated, um, confidentiality, integrity, things like that. And on the right-hand side, some of the more common um, programming language types of uh, I don't want to call them protocols, but so they call them payloads. So the type of traffic that goes across the connection. So certain certain elements only allow certain types of connections. So if you have a thick client, it's probably not going to have an uh, HTTP connection to whatever it's connecting to, like the AD controller. Um, it probably has an IPsec or some other uh, connection type. So watch what you're connecting and make sure that that connector type and protocol match the two points. You also should consider whether the data is being managed by the operating system or by an application and the protocols that that OS or the application might use. Even though this is not a logical network <coughs> diagram, it is a logical data flow diagram. So you should be able to map point to point where the data goes, both on its outbound um, path and the, and the return path. And yeah, so the fun begins. So it's already been fun, right? Um, Finding the right connector is, is like finding the right element. And if you follow the previous comments about looking at what two things are being connected and choosing the correct type of connector, then it's a matter of uh, choosing, uh, at setting the attributes. Allow for shifting of the elements later so that if, if you figure out, for instance, that the external connection goes through the VPN gateway before it gets to the firewall, or it goes through the firewall before it goes through the gateway, that you can make those changes accordingly. Uh, I mentioned this, make sure the, the connector is attached to both elements at both sides. You will get an error message, um, and it'll also increase the number of vulnerabilities if, uh, if they're not connected correctly. You also, you can't mitigate an error if the connection is not made. OK. How is everybody doing? Let's see how many we got seven people left. OK, let's keep going. Oops. 
So this goes back, and I'm going to zip through most of these. You have to know what you're modeling. Uh, if you have a large system, you probably want to break it down into multiple models. Oh, there, <laughs> I knew I had that written down. So you have to indicate on each model where it goes to connect to the, rest of the system that's used, that's shown in a different model. Wasn't that quick? Uh, that was quick and easy. Trust boundaries. So what are they? Um, a one way, to, there's different ways people look at them, but one way is that they represent uh, an access control container. So in other words, users or systems within the boundary are usually cleared or trusted to connect with other things within the boundary. Um, it still requires authentication, but once they're authenticated and operating on the network, uh, let's say there's an internal firewall between um, accounting and HR, if they are both within the same trust boundary, then the fire, once a, the user's authenticated, the trust boundary would allow them to pass through the firewall without having to be rechecked. So the traffic is not um, filtered after it is uh, authenticated the first time. So there, are, there could be other security requirements like encryption that have to be complied with, but usually data is flowing within the boundary without being restricted or filtered. Trust boundaries are not critical to the threat model. Um, they do help show where um, security boundaries are related to access control. You should keep it simple and don't overuse them. Usually, you would not put a trust boundary, although they have one labeled for a single application or a single device. Um, that would be a, almost a worthless trust boundary to put it around a single device because it's going to communicate with itself without going through any security uh, external security devices. So usually, it's a cluster of devices or users that need to be within the boundary. You don't want to, if possible, um, because there's different levels of access with that could be within like a corporate network. But if you don't usually want to embed um, one trust boundary within it, or it's possible to have some overlap, um, but you have to be cautious with that too. So to create a model, so there's three different real, th three different methods, creating it from scratch, which is what um, I started with originally, using a template. Now the template that is loaded with um, TMT just provides you with the stencils. It doesn't actually have a template of a pre-built data model. However, <clears throat> you can create a template for like your environment where you show particular items that are within the environment. And when someone opened your template, those items would already be existing. They wouldn't have to add them to the diagram. They just need to add new stuff to the diagram. So template sort of means two things in this case. The, the default template that comes with the TMT tool only provides stencils and attributes to those stencils. It doesn't provide part of the diagram but you can create a diagram for yourself and then save it as a stencil. And another method is modifying an existing model. So instead of redefining the wheel or reinventing the wheel, you can reuse something that someone else created. Um, it needs to be similar because the, the whole thing is, what's the purpose of, of the model and what are you trying to model? So as long as the the data flow diagram is reasonably similar to what you're going to model. You still need to update the description, the assumptions, and external dependencies, and any other changes that need to be made. Uh, sort of repetitious again, it's a logical data flow. It's not a physical or logical network diagram. You don't have to show all network devices, um, as I, I explained you should show the ones that control the data flow um, or that provide security to the data flow. Now, I said I didn't show routers. 
Um, if you have a router that's a router, firewall, IPS, IDS combination, all-in-one uh, appliance, that's OK to show on the diagram. You would probably want to explain that in somewhere, uh, like adding one of the, um, the text box notes next to it to explain that it's a multi-function security device. Um, so it's up to you how much, how, you don't want to make the diagram too complex because people won't understand it. It also adds complexity to the threat analysis. <clears throat> so I, as I mentioned, there's that text annotation box um, that you can put and place comments on the diagram itself. Sorry, I had to take a little drink of water. Throat. My voice is going. <clears throat> OK, so let me go back real quick and make sure I've covered what we need to cover from this one. So we talked about creating a model, stepping you through, placing. Okay, we've done all that. So there's this screen shows an example of um, I actually do have both overlapping and embedded um, trust boundaries within the, the model that we're looking at. And we'll show that a little bit later. <clears throat> okay, we have to talk about that. So this is this is actually not a complex um, model. This is actually trying to show the trust boundaries in the green the green boxes. So the, the corporate network is the largest trust boundary, and it would have minimal security applied to it. Um, there's a data center, data center boundary. Uh, there's the DMZ within the data center. And then there is a boundary around the cluster of finance application systems. So the firewall, the application server, and the database. And that's embedded within the data center, but not in the DMZ. So it's permissible to have um, overlapping. You just have to know what the security levels are. If you actually see that the corporate boundary, which is the top line going across the page, it cuts down and right here, there's two systems, the VPN gateway and the external um, boundary firewall that are not considered part of the corporate network, but they are part of the DMZ and they're part of the data center. So it could be that other things within the DMZ are not part of the corporate network, considered part of the corporate network, um, but this just one example of the diagram. And this goes, yeah, so this goes through the other the individual All right, so this this is like the original slide set. Okay, now we're getting to the analysis view. So we're gonna go back here. So this analysis view, you were in the design view before, whether you knew it or not. Um, in the analysis view, <clears throat> you're gonna get the top left pane uh, showing the data flow diagram. The middle one will list uh, threats and vulnerabilities and the bottom one will show specific threat properties when you click on one of the threats in the middle. The bottom portion is what needs to be reviewed to mitigate or eliminate the threats. Uh, depending on how complex you made things, I've had some students that uh, their model only has a couple of dozen potential threats, or I've seen you know hundreds, five or 600 potential threats. And it's all based on how you built the model. If you start, if you start your model and it has a couple hundred threats, rethink. Um, make sure, first make sure all the connectors are connected because that actually adds quite a few um, errors that could that are considered threats. So if the connectors are all there and and attached to to the elements, then I would look at the attributes. As to the connectors first, and then look at the attributes to the elements. A lot of the, um, 
the threats come from the connection between two places and not the element themselves. So this is a quick look at the analysis view. So by clicking on this middle, this highlighted one in the middle, brings up the bottom, the uh, information on the bottom. And if you look up in the diagram itself, the finance application and the connector to the database is what's highlighted by, by being uh, bold black. That's what that uh, threat applies to. You have to sort of know what you're doing. And again, this is a team effort to um, identify threats and vulnerabilities. To make it easier, rather than going through the system, you might want to just create an output report that capture, captures all the initial threats that were identified. Because as you start going through, then you're going, then your your list will get lower, but you may not remember where you left off. The other thing is, if you have several threats that are based on the same uh, threat vector, by mitigating one of them, you can go and probably mitigate all of them with the same uh, security measure or whatever you're using. So having a having a printed list makes it easy to go find the uh, the threat ID that's listed and uh, implement the mitigation or or notate the uh, the mitigation. So if you take one threat at a time, because obviously that's and you you can have the team do this so that certain threats are allocated to different members of the team. You have to go back to the design to make the changes, which is another reason it's a good idea to have the report, a threat report printed out because you don't want to switch back and forth all the time. Try adjusting the attributes. So again, maybe you forgot to turn on authentication. Maybe you, for, maybe you want to include um, input or output sanitization. Um, Anyway, so all the different functions of an, of an element should or could come into play. You also might discover that your, your element that you chose doesn't have the attributes that you actually need. So you switch out the element to a different one where you can apply the right attributes. So we're going to assume that you have the correct element. You've now got the correct um, connections and, and you've done as much as you can in the in the tool itself so now you can there's a justification field under the threat properties it could be that you're going to take some security measure action that is actually that's not represented in the diagram itself so you would put that in the justification and then you can mark the um, status of that threat to mitigate it um, there's also a priority to make sure whether it's high, high, medium, or low. And you should try and get through all of the threats identified so you don't have any that show up as a not started category. They need to be one of the other categories, either mitigated, needs investigation, so you've started to look at it, you haven't figured it out yet, or not applicable. And it, once you change that status to something, you need to put a note in that justification box of, of why it's changed. Um, it's possible that you can just refer back to your assumptions and external dependencies. So the justification might say, because we implemented a certain policy or measure system-wide, which is listed in the assumptions, that the particular threat that's listed is no longer valid. It is also possible, uh, as you did up front, if you have a really complex, detailed system description that you're not going to use the whole description in the tool, you might also have an appendix um, to the report, the threat report, where you actually talk about mitigation measures that go beyond what is shown in the in the tool. Okay, creating the report. Let me. Go back here real quick. Analysis view. So this is what we just looked at. So this this shows the status box. It shows mitigated. It shows priority high, and it, and then this justification box along here is where you write in why you changed the status. And then we're getting to the report. To creating the report, which is obviously important. 
before you generate the report, you want to make sure that you have included all of the necessary information in those boxes that we talked about very at the upfront. And especially for the courses, your course assignments, if you can include the information in those boxes, it saves you from having to write a separate uh, a separate document. Um, again, before you do the report, make sure all the connectors are attached and any annotations that you want um, are included. We're going to look at this, uh, select reports from the menu, create a full report. If you do a custom report, it requires you to do other things. Um, when you click on generate report, it's going to ask you to enter a file name and save it as an HTML file. And then it automatically launches whatever your default browser is. Then the HTML report obviously can be scrolled up and down. You can use the save as function to save it usually as a PDF file, hopefully, or you can use the HTML file as the report um, and just transfer that. Let me go back to this other. So this is what the, the report looks like it basically when in HTML. It starts off with the owner. It starts off with those field, the field information it filled out, the owner, the reviewers, the contributors, the description, assumptions, and external dependencies. Then it shows you, uh, starting at the bottom there, the threat model summary. It shows you how many threats were identified. How many are not applicable? Oh, that's not started at the top of the list. Not applicable, needs investigation, mitigate, and mitigated. And then it gives you a total number of threats. The next part of the uh, report shows the diagram itself, and then it starts going through each of the th each individual threat uh, down the list. So this is the report. If you if you do. Um, generate a report so that you can work on the threats separately. This would be the report that you would use, and you just page down. Oops, um, you just page down through the report itself, and I'm going to bring one up in just a second. So let's go back. Hang on a second while I switch. So this is the um, the completed diagram, and I need to so the messages and notes at the bottom are where well, yes and no, Michael. There's I think there's four of them. One, two, three, four. So not really a lot. So um, as I was going to mention at the bottom, so let's, I'm going to take this connector. And even though it looks like it's connected, I'm going to put, it's going to snap to it. <laughs> it's not letting me do what I want it to do. Okay, there, it's not connected. Okay, so... One message found. I know there are. So there's, a, there's. I think there's a setting where you can say snap to connections. So I had one message at the bottom here, and here it tells you the connector should be attached to two elements. If you're not, so if I un, if I unhighlight it up in the top, and I see this error message down here, I can click on the error message and it will highlight which connector it's talking about, and then you can go up and fix it. And then the message goes away. Notes are things to yourself that want to come back um, and take a look at. You just click a note and it puts it in there. It also date and time stamps it. Now I don't know how to get rid of it. 
There we go. Okay, it's gone. All right, so the report up in the menu, reports, create full report, generate report. You can't see what's going on because it's outside of, oh, and I'm going to have to share my browser in just a second here. Let's see, where am I? Sorry, it's trying to save it in a weird directory. Uh, Okay, so let me do, so I generated the report and it came up in the browser, so I've got to stop sharing the application. Share the browser. Wait for it to come up, there it is. Okay, so this is the report that we were looking at. Um, so it has 162 threats that are not, there's no action started on them. Four are considered not applicable. Three need investigation, only two have been mitigated, but there's a total of 171. This shows total mitigated is zero because <clears throat> the mitigation that's up above the two that are mitigated were manually entered into the threat. Um, if, you've, if you've mitigated threats by changing attributes, like uh, like in a connector or an element, then it would um, it would show up under that total mitigated. So here's the the diagram. These um, my if you can see the arrow pointing external step one two and one uh, a and two. So those are examples of the note the annotation notes that can be added. It's just a text box. And this scrolls from side to side, so you see the whole diagram. Then it starts going through all the individual uh, threats. So in this inter in this first category of interaction with HTTPS, it has two, three, four, five. It has nine threats that it found in that one category. Then further interaction with HTTPS, it's now between the web portal and the application. It finds more, 10 through 19. So there's 10 there. So this is where you would go through. Let's see where I've added some mitigation. Let me go back up here. <clears throat> so on number three, um, the category is tampering. The threat model uses the stride method of uh, threat modeling approach. So tampering is uh, number two, is the T in stride. The description is part of the threat model tool. So the threats themselves are already built into the tool. And so the threat here is if the data flow contains XML, there's this potential cross-site scripting type of thing. Um, the mitigation is there is no XML data being transmitted. Um, so the state was changed to not applicable. And the justification is because there's no XML, OK? Uh, so I think that's about, I only, I only mitigated two things. And I don't know where the other one is. But that's, that's how you would use the justification field. Um, and once you've changed the, um, the status or state of it to something different. So I'm not going to go down the whole big group because that's not not what we need. Sorry, I got to reshare.
Okay, so this is back in the tool, and this is the analysis view, just a quick uh, take on it. So what you would want to do, it, there's a bunch of threats shown down here in the middle. So let's just take, so I'm going to expand some of these. So I'm going to take this one that I mitigated. So So potential process crash for the web portal server between the VPN gateway. Um, it's a potential for denial of service. If you see down at the bottom, now that the threat is highlighted, it gives you more details. This is a needs investigation uh, status change. And the justification um, basically talks about having two redundant web servers in the data center using load balancing, manage high usage. Um, so, so how would you, basically you have to justify how you would mitigate a denial of service attack. Oops, that was messed up. Um, and then there's other, there's other system, security systems that help mitigate that as well. So that's just an example of how to document. Let's see, here's another one. This one says mitigated. So now we're down here in the finance application. Authorization bypass is the threat title. It is the, the category is information disclosure. The status was changed to mitigated. It's a high priority. The interaction is IPsec between the application and the database servers. And the um, the description of the threat itself talks about accessing the SQL database. You can can you bypass permissions for the object? And the mitigation is there is no direct access to the database server. It has to go through the finance application, and including DBA access. So a lot of times, in in, in a lot of normal working environments, a DBA has access to, directly to the database server itself. Now it could be. There's different ways to mitigate that, where you have a, um, a production server, a test server, and a development server, and they do all their changes on development, run it through test, and then move it into production. So they're never actually making changes directly to the production server. So that's, that's a policy and procedure type of mitigation. Okay, so that's enough on that. I'm trying to wrap it up here. Okay. So we haven't talked about how long this takes. <laughs> um, and it depends, obviously, on the scope model. For this example and for the, for the, um, the course assignment that you have in 602, uh, these are just my estimates of how much uh, time it would take. And this is an individual person doing this, not a team. If you have a team of people, it should go quicker. So 10 to 12 hours to get through building the whole, the complete first draft of the model, all the connectors and up to the point where you do the analysis. Um, depending on how complicated you make it, actually it could be two two hours to six hours, I think, to do the analysis and review the initial threats. Um, maybe four to eight hours to modify the elements to reduce the threats. Four to eight more out, four to eight more hours to figure out mitigations for all the remaining threats. And then two to three hours to build your report and review it for completeness and accuracy. Um, so that comes out, if you take the numbers up above, it's 28 to 37 working hours over a two week, basically a two week period. That's a lot of effort, and I'm not saying that you need to put in or that would require that much for the course um, example. Uh, it's if if you wanted to be really thorough, 
this is what you would expect. You can probably cut this by a half or a third, probably for doing actual coursework in the 602 class. But uh, in, a, in a job environment, it could be weeks. Uh, it could be, you know, a couple of dozen more hours of a teamwork um, to do it. And it could be more than seven to 10 days. I've made it, I think I made it clear it's a team. team. Um, there's usually one person managing the model itself and the tool, but the team is doing input to it. If you're doing this kind of threat modeling, you want to have a non-technical report for management or people that aren't going to understand all the, the, the ins and outs of the um, data flow or the, the pieces like the connectors. They're not going to know what IPsec is or HTTPS, things like that. So um, management is hopefully making a risk-based decision on your threat model of how to proceed with whatever the project is. A lot of these are used, as I said, in software development, but it's also used for system planning. You should be in the real world. You're going to redo a new iteration of the threat model at major milestones. Now, the good thing about that is you start with the model you created and make modifications to it based on the development that's happened since the first model. Um, or or any changes, make sure you cha update the functions um, or dependencies also. Okie dokie, I think that is the end of this slideshow. So if you have any questions, feel free to email me. Yeah, so, so threat model would be considered um, proprietary and confidential information of the organization that it's done for. Uh, and protected as such. Uh, again, I, I will point you back to the other um, documents that were included in the zip file that's available. Uh, hopefully, they will also answer maybe some of your questions that um, we may or may not have covered or you might discover later. And if you have any questions right now, we can cover them. Otherwise, you can email me uh, questions in the future. So that's all I have for this evening. No problem. I'm glad I could get to do this and share it. All right, so those of you that are in my class, I'll see you Thursday. And those of you that are in other classes, I hope that uh, you uh, proceed through the program as best you can. If you're in the 602 class, um, hopefully this helps you get through your assignments. Everybody have a good night.